Good morning. How are you all? Thanks for coming this morning. Uh, for those of you who are expecting to uh, see Dave Belote up here uh, moderating this this morning, uh, he actually had a uh, combination of maintenance and weather problems at National Airport uh, yesterday afternoon and last evening, got canceled, and is on a plane now along with his deputy, Bill Van Houten. Uh, th they will be with us uh, about mid-morning. Uh, I am Steve Bonner. I am Dave's chief of staff. I work for Booz Allen Hamilton uh, in a uh, uh, contract support role. Uh, so I, I will be moderating the uh, uh, panel this morning and uh, giving at least Dave's briefing for him. Okay? Um, and that's kind of good because I wrote the briefing. <laughs> you know, and I was an Air Force navigator. Dave was a pilot. Well, he started out as a navigator and got, got moved up into the front seat. Um, so I know a hell of a lot more about radar than Dave does. So that's a good thing. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, navigators, the role of the navigator anyway is to hold the uh, banana, right? <laughs> turn right, turn left for the pilots. Right, okay. So now that I've gotten that out of the way, are there any Aggies in the room I could do? No, but that's... <laughs> Uh, our presentation today is, uh, I think, very interesting because it, it, it fits really well with the theme that you see emerging from this conference. If you, if you flip through, you know, the agenda for this conference and look at it, you see the word partnership over and over and over again. You see terms like early engagement over and over and over again. Uh, and what we're going to do here today is first tell you about a new effort that DOD has going on uh, to improve our partnerships and early engagement uh, with state and local government, with the renewable energy industry, and with the public. Uh, and then we're going to talk about two great success stories. Uh, surrounding two very different types of military missions. One being the uh, uh, nuclear deterrent mission in the northern tier. Uh, the other one being the training and testing missions in the southwest. Uh, and uh, talk about, uh, we've got uh, two representatives from local government with us. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, John McQuiston and Mr. Joe Briggs. I want uh, their, their uh, brief biographies are, are in the program. You can, you can review those. Uh, they are both great partners to the Department of Defense and we really appreciate them coming and, and being with us this, this morning. And God, I wish I could roam around because I'd, I'd love to be a moving target when I'm, when I'm giving a briefing. So, the first presentation this morning is about the DOD Siting Clearinghouse. Who hasn't heard about the DOD Siting Clearinghouse yet? Just quickly raise your hand. Just a few people. Okay, so, so good. That means that uh, I'm doing my job right and we're starting to get the uh, uh, word out. Uh, the Siting the Clearinghouse is all about mission compatibility. <clears throat> Okay, and of course DOD has a broad range of missions that we uh, execute uh, across a broad range of domains and we're going to have to add in now as of, what was it, last week, week before last, uh, the domain of cyberspace uh, was, was officially recognized uh, along with land, water, air, and space as our operational domains. And we've had some interesting adventures over the last few years with renewable energy and compatibility with missions. There have been some unintended consequences that have, that have hit us uh, in some very unexpected ways caused both by the boom in renewable energy development, most especially uh, solar and wind, uh, but also, to some degree, by advances in our own technology and changes in, in some of the sensing systems and the like that have problems now with the, the, the wind energy or, or solar energy technology that, that we weren't ex expecting. And frankly, our policies 
just have not been up to date uh, the way they need to be. Uh, and, and this is uh, another recurring theme that you're going to hear throughout this conference is how DOD is improving uh, its engagement and outreach and policies, not just with renewable energy, but with all forms of mission compatibility issues such as uh, species issues, uh, urban sprawl issues, uh, water availability and quality issues, and others. Well, let's start out with uh, a couple of quick case studies of why uh, we've been having a problem. Okay, several years ago, Dave Belote, who uh, uh, should be giving this briefing, was the uh, uh, Air Base Wing Commander at Nellis Air Force Base, which is, of course, right down here just northeast of, uh, of Las Vegas. Guy came into his office and said, Dave, I want to put in a new solar technology, a concentrating solar uh, power generation system that is going to store uh, the energy in the form of liquid salts in the ground that will then it, at nighttime be used to fire boilers and turbines so that we, we suddenly have solar energy that, that uh, stretches well into the nighttime hours in terms of availability. And Dave said, hey, that sounds like a great idea to me. The only problem is there's some things that go on down here in the Nevada test and training range that don't get along well with some of the things that, that might come from your development. Some of those things might, might be things like glint and glare off of mirrors, uh, pretty obvious, but uh, maybe more so uh, the things like the heat radiation and the electromagnetic fields that, that will be generated around that uh, uh, development uh, could be problematic for some of the sensors that are important to the development of uh, in, in test and uh, in training of weapons uh, on the Nevada test and training range. Okay, so happily, this developer came into his office very early in the process on a voluntary basis. So they were able to talk. The developer came back and said, well, how about if I move it out here? Well, Dave went to his staff. They took a look at it and said, well, that's better, but it still hurts us. And at that point, the developer kind of felt like you know, the, that, that he was beginning to get the uh, old government runaround, okay? So they went back and forth, argued with each other. There were letters uh, to the Secretary of Defense from a guy named Harry Reid, or excuse me, to the Secretary of the Air Force from a guy named Harry Reid uh, that said, why are we standing in the way of this development? Well, uh, long story short, the uh, negotiation went on, and the Crescent Dunes project finally moved out here, where now the scientists were able to say, hey, no worries, no problem. Okay, so that's a mitigation through location change that worked out well for the Air Force. Yes, sir. You want to fill in the blanks for me because you were there? My team was the engineers that worked that issue. Good. We never did really come to a total agreement of no mitigation. Colonel uh, Borchelt was also somewhat involved in this out of Nellis. They ended up going through four engineering firms. It was Terry Murphy, Kevin Smith out of Solar Reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the president and the CEO and the C, uh, chief financial officer. The first two engineering firms that they went through said, you know what, those guys aren't wrong. This is going to cause the issues they're saying. It went up until we had to go to the scientific advisory board and there was a big arbitration. Uh, MIT Lincoln Labs um, put together their team, we put together our team. When it was finally agreed upon where they're going to be, it's still that there is an issue, but we feel we can live with it. It's not totally mitigated. Okay. There's still going to be some concern. And the problem is, is nobody's ever built one of these before. Right. We don't know. Right now we're doing engineering. The rule with all engineering and models is what? They're all wrong. <laughs> you, you use them because they're the best you have. But we don't know if we're going to be so off base on this that this is going to cause still significant issues, which we'll then learn to live with, 
or if it'll be no issue. You know, so, but it's all on, based on engineering and modeling, which uh, it's a crapshoot. So we, we did negotiate with them, and when they came into Dave's office, they had already had an engineer, and it was their first engineer with a company, a guy named Lance, who we worked with. But yeah, they've moved it and moved it and moved it to a point where we've just said, you know what, we're going to have to live with it. But I always, I'm always worried about saying we've totally mitigated or we agreed okay, to. Fair enough. We didn't agree to Shepherd's Flats either. That's another one crammed right, down our throats. Right, and we're going to talk about that next. So, all right, thank you. Super, thanks very much. And it, it, it's really good to be able to fill in the blanks here because this is, this is a uh, briefing that, of course, is uh, d designed for, for a, a broader audience. So, so thanks. And any other, uh, by the way, interjections, questions would be, would be welcome. If uh, I see us uh, getting too bogged down in questions, I may ask you to, to hold them to the end. But uh, for now, uh, people always get more out of an interactive discussion as opposed to <coughs> just the talking head up here, here lecturing. So, so please, bring them on. Okay, so anyway, the, 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 the message here ultimately is this one, congressional. We started getting a lot of attention from the Congress on this issue. And then this happened. This was uh, spring of uh, 2010, uh, a proposal for the Shepherd's Flat Wind Farm, which is here in northern Oregon, of course, uh, and the uh, developer had gone to Mountain Home Air Force Base early on uh, because within the uh, flight information publications, uh, it uh, reads that the low-level training routes that fly through, through this area of the, uh, of course, this is the Columbia River Gorge, uh, belong to Mountain Home Air Force Base. So he said, hey, any problems with this? And they looked at it and said, no, no worries. Okay, so this developer now had an answer from the United States Air Force, from the federal government, that said, no worries, go ahead, build it. Okay, now, when it came up for actual construction, though, all of a sudden, instead of the relatively low-ranking guys at Mountain Home Air Force Base saying, hey, we got a problem, the folks who run the radar at Fossil Oregon, which is a long-range radar that's part of our national uh, surveillance radar, our, our uh, security uh, radar system, uh, suddenly cried foul. And all of a sudden, instead of a low-ranking person from Mountain Home Air Force Base, this was a four-star general from NORAD Northcom. And this was approximately 30 to 60 days before the uh, developer was planning on uh, uh, breaking ground. Big problem. So what do you do if you're a developer in that situation and somebody with all the ribbons and stars and everything stands up and says no and you've already got a bunch of costs sunk into this, this project, developing it, finding the site, studying it, getting it ready to go. Well. You go to Congress, right? And you say, help. And that's exactly what, what these guys did. Congress said, all right, enough's enough. You guys are standing in the way of way too much renewable energy, okay? By this time, oh, by the way, the other backstory is that within DOD, we had also significantly slowed down our processing of applications through the FAA obstruction evaluation system uh, for especially the wind energy uh, generating projects, okay? Because we were, we were just kind of putting on the brakes saying, wait a minute, we don't know what we don't know yet, okay? We're not exactly sure how this is gonna affect us and we need to slow down and take a break. Well, that's fine for DOD, but if you're suddenly slowing down renewable energy projects, what are you doing? You're keeping new energy off of the grid. You're keeping clean, greenhouse gas positive, uh, secure. Yeah, I heard the word expensive, but there's a, there's a lot of other policy things going on that we'll get into in, in, in just a second. 
uh, and all of a sudden you have the American Wind Energy Association saying, hey, you guys, are, you guys realize you're standing in the way of 10 gigawatts of new renewable energy? And frankly, no, we didn't. Happily, I think we'll come to a good outcome here by the, by the end of this, this briefing. So what kind of lessons did we learn from this? They were, they were mostly bad lessons, and we learned them slowly, okay? Not unusual for DOD, is it? Okay, uh, it's part of, part of this bureaucracy that I've, I've been in for, for quite a while now. Uh, it takes us a while to really get it and move it ahead. So we were here, we were, we were doing things on a pure case-by-case -case basis now. We had uneven coordination between the services. We had started to have service attitudes diverge from each other about whether renewable energy was good or bad for our missions and, and what we should be doing about it, and we didn't have a single voice. And all of this just continued to get on Congress's nerves. So we began last summer developing a DOD energy site and clearinghouse. Dave Pelote was hired into the job uh, a year ago last week. And uh, I came on board with him in September. And we started this process of creating this new animal within DOD, which if you've ever done it before, this is the third time I've done this now, starting with BRAC way back. And uh, it is a long iterative process to create a new program within, within DOD. So Congress gave us a, a kickstart. <clears throat> Within the, uh, the current year's National Defense Authorization Act, if you're unfamiliar with it, go read Section 358. Okay, it is, you know, kind of obscurely entitled The Study of Effects of New Construction of Obstructions on Military Installations and Operations. Okay, what it really does is formally task the department to create the DOD Siting Clearinghouse. It tasks us to create an integrated review process. It tasked us to go through and clear out the backlog that we had been setting up. Remember I said we put the brakes on projects for a while? Tasked us to get those cleared out of the system, some that went all the way back to 2008. Uh, it tasked us to begin work on mitigation options other than just saying no, just moving the, the, the site further away or, or, or changing it. Uh, putting together a comprehensive strategy for addressing these impacts that include all the different types of mitigation options. And most significantly, because this, this section of the NDAA was mostly written uh, from a wind energy uh, industry perspective, it made it extremely difficult for the department to just say no. Okay. As of July 15th of this year, officially, when Secretary Panetta, one of his early actions in the, in the job uh, was to sign a designation memo that delegates the authority to object to a project to the Deputy Secretary of Defense and only the Deputy Secretary of Defense. And in order to object to that project, under the, the uh, guidance of Section 358, the Deputy Secretary has to find that that project presents an unacceptable risk to the national security of the United States. That is an extremely high bar to reach. Okay, now that doesn't, doesn't say that we can't go out and work with developers. This is not a gag order that says only the Deputy Secretary can talk to the, to the industry. Uh, what it is, though, is if we've got a real no-kidding problem with a mission, then we've got to be able to take it all the way up through the various service chains into the OSD chain and uh, uh, through, through, you know, uh, leader after leader, we're going to have to convince them that, hey, this really is a real problem. This is not something we're going to be able to mitigate. And we have to be able to work with industry to try to mitigate it first. 
Okay, so now there is a single DOD voice. We now have, we hope, a timely, repeatable, and predictable process. We're about to put that to the test. We, we, I mentioned we cleared out the 180-day backlog, that, as we call it, the, the, the backlog of projects that ran all the way back to 2008. I'll tell you what the results of that were at the end of this briefing. Uh, in that time, though, since January 7th, since the President signed the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, another 410 projects have come into the queue. So we are about to, to put our new process really to the test and, and start grinding on projects here, as a matter of fact, this week. Now, it's important to note, though, that only projects with a truly significant impact are going to go through the full review process of the clearinghouse. And I'll get some more into the concept of operations of the clearinghouse here, here in just a couple of minutes. The vast majority of projects, those 410 projects that, that, that I mentioned, uh, are probably going to end up just like the, the, the backlog of projects. The vast majority of those ultimately pose little or no impact uh, to uh, military missions. And uh, we will not be objecting to them, and it will go through a simple review and very quickly uh, get back to uh, the uh, necessary oversight agency. So, what is the concept of ops? Well, it is a quick flash coordination of every project that comes in. We have direct super user access into the FAA obstruction evaluation database now. Uh, we are working extremely closely with the Bureau of Land Management with their uh, process to, uh, to be able to get information in and spit it back out to everybody very quickly. One of our competing sessions this morning, one that uh, is going to be repeated this afternoon, that if you're, if, if you're really interested in how this is, is going to work, I would encourage you to, to go look at, is uh, the MCAT the Mission Compatibility Analysis Tool session. That is the tool that the Clearinghouse will be using to do the initial evaluations of these projects and to track them and uh, provide us with a uh, coordination database. Uh, we're going to provide oversight and coordination of mitigation negotiations. Note that I did not say we're going to do the, the mitigation negotiations. Uh, one of the, the things that we are trying the hardest to do, even though Congress and the industry has been pushing us to a single voice and trying to get us to do everything in Washington, is we, we just don't want to take the mid-level headquarters or especially the installations on the ground, the folks who are in the field actually doing the work. Uh, we want them to be able to talk with the developers and them to be able to figure out what is and is not uh, compatible with, with their missions. Uh, we're going to be doing an awful lot of outreach and consultation with uh, industry, local and state governments, uh, other federal agencies, and, and the public in general. I'll talk some more about a uh, rule that is about to be published uh, that addresses that in just a few minutes. And it's important to note, uh, especially for those of you, if any of you are, are from industry in this, this uh, room this morning, this is not a replacement for other federal regulatory actions. This is not a regulatory action. This is a way for the Department of Defense to express its opinion, its position on a project through a single voice. So your project is still going to have to go through the FAA OEAAA process if it's, a, if it's taller than 200 feet in the air. It's going to have to go through the NEPA process if it's being built on Bureau of Land Management land or other, other public lands, and if it creates uh, some type of electromagnetic uh, uh, emissions, whether it, actively or passively, it's going to have to go through the uh, NTIA review uh, to, to, to make sure it's not uh, conflicting with other, other parts of the spectrum. So what is this, how are we actually reviewing projects? Pretty simple. Little three by three matrix. Okay, we look at it through the lens of three major mission 
uh, uh, groups, if you will. First, training and readiness, led by the Office of the Deputy, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Readiness. Uh, that will, will look at, of course, the military training routes, special use airspace that's used for, for training, uh, same thing for, for operational readiness capabilities, uh, and will also be the, uh, the filter through which we will put uh, all the approach and departure radar uh, of, of all of our airfields through there. Long-range radar and surveillance. This is the combination of NORAD NORTHCOM with the Department of Homeland Security through the Joint, Proge Joint Program Office uh, that will be overseen by, by, by our office and, and coordinated. And then finally, test and evaluation. And the, the T&E portion will be led by the uh, uh, Office of the Director of Operational Test and Evaluation. Uh, and I've just named basically the three co-chairs of our board of directors, which I'll get into in just a minute. So we get a project in, we put it into, by the way, this is a, a screen capture, a partial screen capture of what the MCAT system looks like. We pop this project into MCAT. We take a look at where it is in proximity to various missions. We've got some, some uh, technical experts on staff in the, the, the clearinghouse. Uh, we make a quick value judgment. Do we think there is any impact at all on any military mission? Uh, if no, then we just inform the services and, and uh, move ahead. Uh, if yes, then we task further study out to the appropriate service. And they come back to us with an answer, okay? Either it is a minor impact or no impact. Uh, and, oh, by the way, these red, yellow, green colors, these are internal only. We're not going to be producing any red, yellow, and green maps, which I'll uh, talk a little bit more about uh, uh, later this morning. Uh, the project may have a major impact, but we may believe that mitigation is possible. And the last presentation this morning is going to go through, uh, we're actually going to have, uh, uh, contrary to what your uh, uh, agendas say we're going to have four presentations this morning, the last one being about the research and development of, of, of mitigation technologies that are, that's going on. Or we're going to say, hey, this has a major impact and mitigation is not possible. In other words, there's a great danger of mission failure here. Now note that that does not mean that there's automatically an unacceptable risk to the national security of the United States. What it means is that we're going to have to evaluate this very carefully and work closely with the, uh, the developers. The task, if we either, either find in the yellow or red area, becomes first to go out and talk with the developers and say, hey, can you move it? Can you reconfigure it? Can you help us out with, with uh, uh, some type of a technological mitigation, which, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, Section 358, one of the most important uh, uh, aspects of that, and what we'll talk about later this morning, is that it allows us to accept contributions from industry to uh, uh, mitigate impacts. So we're, we're putting together procedures for that now. And if we can't get to an agreement with industry, that's when we start the process of saying, okay, maybe this is an unacceptable risk to the national security of the United States. And oh, by the way, we're supposed to do all of this by law now in 30 days. Real challenge within DOD to be able to do all of this within 30 days. Uh, but we think we're getting a, a process set up that's uh, going to get us at least close, if not, not within that window on a regular basis. Okay, here's how we're organized. I mentioned that there's three co-chairs, Dr. Dorothy Robine, who will be one of our plenary uh, speakers tomorrow morning, uh, is the uh, Deputy Undersecretary for Installations and Environment. Uh, Dr. Laura Junor, 
is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Personnel and Readiness. And Mr. David Duma is the Principal Deputy Director for Operational Test and Evaluation. Those are the three co-chairs. Then the Assistant Secretaries from each of the three services in Installations, Environment, and Energy uh, are, have seats at the table. So that's uh, Ms. Hammock for the Army, Ms. Fannin-Steele for the Navy, and Mr. Yonkers for the Air Force. Uh, the Joint Staff has a seat at the table in the form of Major General Angelella and Homeland Defense in the cases of long-range radar impacts has a seat at the table uh, through Mr. McMiniman, if you're familiar with, with those folks. Okay, I, I talked about earlier that, that we were going to get to how are we reaching out and engaging with uh, uh, local state government, industry, and the public. Uh, the law requires that we publish, it doesn't specifically require, but uh, the Administrative Procedures Act uh, combined with the law uh, requires that we publish a rule in the Federal Register. This rule will be 32 CFR Part 211. Uh, we hope it will be published within the next 30 days or so. It is in final coordination now inside the Pentagon and will be transmitted by the uh, General Counsel of the Department of Defense to the OMB, uh, who will put it through a very fast track interagency coordination and then we'll publish the rule. Uh, on the date the rule is published, it goes into effect. It helps us define some of these things like, you know, I, I've said this phrase several times, unacceptable risk. Well, what does that really mean? This rule will help us. It gives us some, some guidelines on, on what that means. And most importantly, it's going to give guidelines to industry and to state and local government as to how to engage with us, hopefully as early as possible in project development so that we can, we can work with them early on. And it will also then serve as the foundation for the development of internal procedures inside DOD uh, in the form of a DOD instruction. Well, I mentioned that backlog. When we first started looking at it, we said, oh my God, there's over 6,000 projects here. Well, what that meant was there were 6,000, there were over 6,300 actually, individual aeronautical studies in the FAA's database for the obstruction evaluation program. Okay. Under FAA rules, every turbine, every new tower, has its own aeronautical study. Okay, so what we were really looking at was a total of 6,300 plus proposed wind turbines. We were also looking at uh, about 30 solar projects and we were looking at two uh, geothermal projects. Uh, we included in the, in the backlog, even though we were only required by law to look at the FAA database, we included the uh, projects that were proposed in the BLM fast track process uh, to be able to go ahead and give them the attention that, that they deserved and, and, and move it ahead. Uh, so after sifting through for quite a while and figuring it out and getting our act together, we went to Ogden, Utah, Hill Air Force Base, pulled, air, pulled a bunch of subject matter experts together. We sorted through all these projects. We ranked them either, you know, that minor impact, major impact, but mitigatable, major impact, not mitigatable. Then we farmed all those through a series of taskers out to the services for their review, churned through this, got them all back, figured out we had 249 projects in the backlog. Okay. Some of those had been delayed, like I said, since 2008. We found that, oh, the Wind Energy Association was right. We have been delaying over 10 gigawatts of power billions of dollars worth of investment. Okay. We cleared uh, on July the 9th uh, in the Board of Directors meeting 
229 of those projects. We removed all DOD objections to those projects through this process. Notice that I didn't say we removed all, all DOD objections because there's still possibilities of objections coming through the, the NEPA process, for instance, in the BLM projects because all of those are conceptual at this point only. Okay, but 229, uh, we put out a, a press release week before last on that. 20 projects were found to have either major impact and were mitigatable or major impact and we don't think they're mitigatable. Those are now tasked back out to the lead services to go back and work with industry and see if we can, can develop some uh, uh, mutually acceptable mitigation options. Okay, and we have cleared, if you, if you look at it, actually Wind Energy Association was wrong. Uh, it, it was closer to about 13 gigawatts of power, we figured out, uh, that are now, from the DOD's perspective, free to move ahead and uh, uh, begin providing power as soon as they get built for uh, energy security purposes, to help us with our, our greenhouse gas emissions, and to provide uh, uh, electricity uh, for the nation. And that is the completion of Dave, Dave Belote's project. Dave isn't present with us, but he is in spirit, uh, and, and he uses this as proof. Uh, he, he says either that, that, yes, he was doing the right thing while he was at Nellis and was able to rub elbows with some fairly important people, or he's really good at Photoshop. Okay. With that, I'll take a few questions. Yes, sir. Were you able, were you able to do this without ramping up the number of people to do all these studies? Or how were you able to take care of all these that's, th that's a great question. If you didn't hear it, and oh, by the way, there is a mic here in, in, in the middle of the room. It's kind of a, a big room. The, the, the question was, okay, were, were we able to do all of this review of all these 249 projects without ramping up more people? Uh, the answer is no and yes. Okay. Uh, the no part is that, that just creating the clearinghouse itself, DOD did indeed have to, have to uh, uh, build some more capability. And so through a partnership with the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Readiness uh, and does the I and E, uh, funding was, was uh, found for three different contracts. One is with Booz Allen Hamilton, who I represent. Uh, another one is with the Institute of Defense Analysis and the third is with Northrop Grumman. I serve as the chief of staff to pull all of those three together and support the clearinghouse. So, so yeah, we did have to get some more resources for that. Uh, are more resources needed in the field? Oh, you betcha. And the, the, some of the technical aspects of, of these, these impacts, uh, we just have very limited capability to understand what they are and to even begin predicting what they, they may be in the future. Okay, uh, the 84th raids, the, the radar evaluation squadron at Hill Air Force Base, they've got, what, four people, I think, working this now? Okay, they're the, the central technical experts. The joint project office, pro, excuse me, joint program office has a few people. And each of the services is doing their evaluations through a combination of the installations and environment side of the house and the operations, the, generally the, the, the three section, the G3, the A3O uh, type folks who understand the missions best. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Right. So is there any effort going on from the clearinghouse perspective to work with the entity industry to help create linkages between Absolutely, both the with the both with industry and with the other federal agencies who are cognizant and the presentation later this morning will will go into to much greater detail about our cooperation with FAA 
through uh, the, the Interagency Policy Committee or Subcommittee on the Air Domain uh, and how we have, have engaged with them and already gotten them to, to take what was a 30-day notification process and stretch it to 45. Well, you know, small comfort, 15 extra days doesn't really help all that, that much. We're, we're working hard to get them to, to stretch it to six months at least. Uh, to, they, are, they already have an early notification voluntary process in place with industry and part of the reason we're, we're publishing the rule that we're publishing and that we're doing the kind of outreach efforts we're going to be doing at, we're given the exact same briefing at Sunday a week ago, the Association of Defense Communities for outreach to state and local government, uh, the exact same briefing to uh, uh, the uh, American Wind Energy Association meetings, the Solar Energy Association meetings, trying to get industry to come to us as early as possible because, yeah, 30 days is just not good. Follow-up? One follow-up question, yes, please. The other thing I'd really like to ask you guys to look at at some point is the combination of regulations from all of the related um, jurisdictions and agencies that combine to sometimes force upon the industry um, practices that are in conflict with what we would like them to do. But the regulations that are in place prohibit them from cooperating with us on those right. things. And uh, so right. of your assistance in that regard. Ab absolutely. And as an example, uh, we are preparing the first report to Congress right now. Uh, we are uh, providing some ideas to Congress about possible future legislation, one of them being uh, uh, changes to the FAA's oversight process. So I hand over here. Yeah, I work as a developer for Supergoal Renewables. Yeah, hi. Large scale project. Um, and my question was around how do you know as a developer if your project needs to go through the site or solar panels? Is there any thresholds, guidelines? How would you determine if you do or can't? All of them. All of them should at least get a quick look from the technical team that I lead. Okay. Um, that's the safest way to do it, and, and, and that's what we're defaulting to w with the OE AAA database. So every project that goes into that database is going to get a quick look, at least. Um, and then we will we'll be able to identify if there is a potential problem or not, and then get it out to the right service to, to, to work on that. Okay? Sir? Back there, and then you. Real quick, I didn't say my name. I'm Jim Russo. I go by inspector, and I'm out of the Department of the Air Force. 84th Raids out of Hill hasn't done any study since 02 when they did the Doppler analysis study. Dr. Dorothy Rubine made a comment after Senator Wyden pushed Shepard Flats down our throat mm -hmm. of the cumulative effect. Yes. How are you if something's not built, or what is your analysis tool for a cumulative effect rather than saying, not an issue, not an issue, not an issue, but mm -hmm. when you put them together, it's a screw job. Right. That's, that is a, a big tight rope that we're walking right now. There isn't a tool, as you well know. Yeah. I'm, you know, uh, uh, and, and. I'm trying to make one. Part of, part of what's going on is, is, yeah, the creation of tools. And like I said, we'll be talking about the R&D process, in, including the creation of, of uh, uh, impact analysis tools. And the other, uh, this is just a comment for everybody, two words that always concern me. It possibly, which means it's possibly or not possibly, may not impact, which means it may. Those two words in any sentence, did anybody fly here? How'd you like to hear the pilot go, I think I might be able to make this landing? Doesn't mean he can't, it just means he thinks he might. So whenever we start going out with the it possibly may not have an impact. I don't know if that's the threshold we want to use in the, in the Department of Defense. Good point. Thanks. Yes, sir. All of the above plus some. Because we know that they're every further layer and every flight delay is a financial risk to those guys because they're trying to meet deadlines or get incentive money revenues and all that. So 
Absolutely. That, that would be great. We, we, we definitely want the local installations to be engaged and, and know about it. We understand that a lot of installations just simply don't have the staff to be as engaged as, say, Nellis Air Force Base has been uh, because they made the commitment and the investment. Uh, the, the clearinghouse doesn't drive those, those MTRs. It would be the, 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 the trainers on the, the, like for instance, the A30, the N45 side of the house that, that would, would do this. Uh, so no, I don't believe that there is an overall comprehensive re review, but there is an individual review with each uh, uh, project that we look at. For instance, uh, we really confused the Bureau of Land Management when we sent them a, their letter about all these 229 projects. There were, there were 45 BLM projects that we, we, we reviewed. Uh, and on, on one particular project in Utah, they said, we don't get it. You guys are not objecting to this, this wind project, yet you've got an MTR that has a floor of 200 feet flying, th flying right through the middle of this project. Okay, well, the reality is that th that happens to be one of those MTRs that is not uh, used all that much and that it frankly isn't that difficult for uh, a modern air aircraft to just pop up a little bit for a couple of miles and then pop down. Okay, does it does it affect the quality of the training? Yes. But is that, that, is our ability to do that through that operational mitigation you know, uh, acceptable or does doing that pose an unacceptable risk to the national security of the United States? Uh -uh. Just cannot meet that, that bar. Any other questions? Last one. The law doesn't tell us how long we've got to do that detailed study. Now, industry's going to hate that because that means, in theory, we could, you know, still drag those studies out for years. Okay, uh, but the DODI will limit the, the 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 total amount of time that we'll spend on those internally. Okay, and we will try to keep those down to not more than say six months. Keep in mind that this is a, a what, a year old effort now, okay? Uh, uh, the feedback that, that, that I get from, we met with the uh, House Armed Services Committee staff down in Norfolk, as a matter of fact, uh, last week. Uh, the feedback that we're getting from Congress, the feedback that we're getting from, from leadership is, gosh, you, for 
compared to other programs, you guys are moving at light speed, and yet yeah, feels sometimes like a snail's pace. So no, we don't have everything in place so that all of these different NEPA, 404, NTIA, et cetera, you know, fit together neatly. We're working that through the interagency engagement that, that we're doing. That's going to be a long process to get in place because now we're talking about getting multiple other federal agencies to change how they do business to mesh with ours. So right now, what you've got uh, is two opportunities to engage. We've got, under Section 358, the codified authorities to go out and engage through Section 358, and you're going to have then, for instance, in North Carolina, the 404 permitting process. Okay? So that's the way I would look at it for now. Hopefully we'll get that, that mesh back together in the future. Okay, let's move on. I want to make sure I get the right one up here. Okay, so I, I promised you that we would be talking about, wait a minute. Okay with you guys? Everything you want to do that. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, so I mentioned that we have uh, two very different types of missions going on that we've been dealing with local government uh, for a number of years on. And uh, I, I want to take this moment to uh, express the appreciation of the DOD Site and Clearinghouse to the Office of Economic Adjustment for your help in uh, uh, reaching out to, uh, to, to local government. We know how important uh, uh, you are to this process and we appreciate your help in putting this uh, uh, workshop together this, this morning. Joe Briggs is from Montana. Okay, what kind of missions do we have in Montana? Anyone? Pardon? Training missions. Training missions, what else? has to do with big holes in the ground. National defense. <coughs> the last of our missiles live up near Joe Briggs. Okay. Still a vital part of the national strategy for protection of the United States of America. Talk about unintended consequences. Seems, seems to me like windmills and missile silos ought to live pretty well together. Turns out that there are some issues that uh, Joe has been extremely helpful with and that, that uh, we have been able to, uh, to work together to uh, solve and create relationships that will now be ongoing to be able to uh, uh, address future problems. So with that, Mr. Joe Briggs, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, this is kind of a far cry from Montana, both in terms of humidity, population base, and temperature. Um, but uh, we will survive. As Steve mentioned, Monstrum Air Force Base, which is the uh, operation that's most well known in Montana, plays a very unique role because it's a nuclear facility. Um, those of us who live in Montana are so used to them that we often don't think about the fact that scattered throughout an area that is literally the size of West Virginia across nine Montana counties, there are 150 uh, nuclear-tipped missiles, enough destructive force that if you looked at Molstrom Air Force Base in and of itself, it is like the third largest nuclear power in the world. Uh, just kind of put things in context. And so the you know, we've been rolling along and, and uh, like everybody else, you're looking for alternate energy sources. And we didn't really think about the fact that, that all these windmills that are being proposed would represent a problem to the military. Further we got into it, the more we, we started to see issues. We're currently in the middle of a JLU study, which uh, Matrix is our contractor for. And the first time that we met with the, the Air Force folks, because we're talking about your typical JLUS, you know, you take the, the perimeter of the base itself and you, you add 
X number of uh, feet of distance, and that becomes a JLUS. First time we went with the Malmstrom guys, they said, you know, our problem is not right around the base. Our problem is out in the missile field, out in that 23,500 square miles of privately owned property with tiny little enclaves of easements owned by the Air Force. A little different ball game. And obviously, it falls to local government to work those kind of issues. Uh, I, I have to admit a real level of ignorance because until I was contacted about speaking at this conference, I'd never heard of the clearinghouse that you've just been briefed on. I think it's a tremendous idea, probably way overdue, but I think like a lot of folks involved in the wind energy industry in, in some regard, it's a whole new concept. It's another layer that nobody was aware of and wasn't really sure how it fits. So most of my comments are going to be regarding how we've been doing it in the absence of that clearinghouse. And I think a lot of what we've done is still of value and will have to be obviously modified a little bit to make sure that it works well with the clearinghouse concept. But the concepts are nonetheless valid. So why as a local government official should I care? Well, military missions are incredibly important, especially in an area like Great Falls, Montana. They mean jobs for the local civilians. The military presence really enhances our cultural diversity. Montana is, is a pretty, um, I wouldn't say culturally bleak by any way, shape, or form, but we're kind of homogenous. Um, the presence of the military just adds a whole new layer of interests, talents, skills. Uh, it, especially in Great Falls, it is an integral part of our community that the loss of the military to us would be devastating on socioeconomic basis, on personal basis, volunteer organizations, every level of, of our uh, community would suffer with that. <coughs> because, <coughs> like I said, they, they add to our cultural diversity, provide a steady source of new talents in the form of active service members. We pride ourselves on a number of people who return to Great Falls to retire out of the military because they love it there. Uh, our, re our retirees are an integral part of, of everything we do, children and military spouses. Um, we consider hosting a military mission a source of pride for the community. It's one of the things that defines Great Falls. We are Monster Air Force Base. The mission brings a lot of outside dollars. That's important to a local government official. Um, as I said, the, the men and women are an integral part of our community who really would be missed if they were gone. They add economic opportunity for everybody. And most importantly, of course, is their day-to-day -day mission is to keep the rest of us free so we can goof off. <coughs> the other side of the coin is renewable energy projects are also very important. They mean jobs for local civilians. And this, to a, to a county government official, this is key. They create a tax base that is low cost for the jurisdiction. Not all development is created equal from the standpoint of a local government. If you get a housing development, that costs you allotted infrastructure to service it. It costs you additional fire protection. It costs you additional police protection. Typically, most studies will show you that unless you're talking about very high-end housing, housing development actually costs you more than it generates in tax base. Windmills, geez, they put the things up, and for the next 30 years, they pay taxes, and you never touch them. You know, the company has to do things with them. I've never seen a windmill commit a crime. Um, you know, you don't, you don't send cops out. You don't send fire departments out. So it, it's really a great thing. Once again, their presence creates an additional economic opportunity for everybody. This is, I think, <coughs> one of the real turning points is people are starting to realize that energy independence is an integral part of our national defense. The more independent we are, the greater latitude we have in how we operate our foreign policies, where we have to engage and where we don't have to. So the renewable energy is an important part of our energy independence. And it creates a whole new vocational set of opportunities for people. But, and this is the important thing, if it's not done correctly, it can damage the long-term viability of your existing missions and preclude future missions. Now, in Great Falls, that's incredibly important to us because we have some assets that are becoming in short supply. And that is we have over 350 clear flying days a year and we've got lots of area to fly over with nobody underneath it. This is one of the few areas where our lack of population is an advantage. We're perfect for, for training flights, that kind of opportunities. We have a lot of place for tanks to roam around, you know, that kind of thing. 
Um, so we don't want to goof up any potential opportunities because who knows what the military of tomorrow is going to look like. <coughs> so the challenge from local government standpoint is how do we encourage the development because we want the windmills, we want the other renewable energies, but how do we do it without conflict? Now the challenge obviously will vary from mission to mission, but in my opinion this, the fundamentals are always the same. Early detection and deconfliction of the potential interference is critical. Just like any course correction, the earlier you know that you have to make it, the smaller the correction is required. So if a developer knows in his very uh, preliminary, uh, before he's done any ground engineering, if he just conceptually knows I've got an issue or I might have an issue, it is much easier for them to adapt than it is to when they're getting the final site prepped. Uh, they've got towers coming in or they've already got towers up and somebody stands up and said, hey, wait a minute, you can't put it there. <coughs> so the er earlier you can address it in the planning process, the easier and less expensive the solution. What we've discovered is although you have areas in which you want to site wind, the specific location of each individual tower is not something you can't change. The developers we've worked with have shown a, a remarkable ability, if they know about it up front, that they can move the actual tower displacement. So it's generally not a problem for the developer to adapt early on. But last minute objections by the military or anything else just lead to lawsuits. And the common theme through this is always communication. The better you communicate with the developers, the military's concerns, the community's concerns, and the earlier that happens, the better off you are. <coughs> so just, uh, you know, communication is simple. But if you talk to a developer, if you look at their view, this is kind of the historic thing. Now hopefully the, this clearinghouse will change this, but uh, from a developer standpoint, my project's outside of the base. I don't need to talk to those guys. What's, you know, what's to them? We heard this a little bit this morning. Time is money. You're slowing me down. What do you mean I can't build it there? I own that land. I can do what I want with it. If you don't want me to build there, buy me out. I mean, I think everybody has heard that one. I know God knows I've heard that enough. Um, and I have the required permits from the city and the county and the state, so leave me alone. That's a real common one, too. And I guess I probably should have put the FAA in there, too, because we've had a couple of these that the FAA has cleared, and then when we got on the ground and worked with Malmstrom, there was a problem. From the base planner, now this, uh, thankfully, is changing, but this, even just a couple of years ago, it's outside the fence, not my problem. If they build it and it's a problem, we'll just stop them. No big deal. We're the military. We win all the fights. How dare they? I've got nuclear missiles. You know, don't tell me what I'm going to do. Play the national defense card. Works every time. Uh, as a private citizen, as a private industry, if they come and they say, this affects national defense, what do you say? I mean, where do you go from there? Um, they wouldn't even have property rights if not for the military protecting them. And the last one is, can you say eminent domain? Uh, those are kind of the things we used to hear from the base standpoint. <coughs> now, Monster, as I said, is not your typical base. It's the home of the 341st Missile Squadron, the first and the best ICBM wing in the world. Now, if there's anybody here from North Dakota or Wyoming, I'm sorry if the truth hurts. <laughs> the area contains 221 distinct secured military compounds within 23,500 square miles. Once again, that's basically West Virginia, parked in the part of Montana. And that is 99% privately owned with just these little enclaves that the military has easements on. The 20, 221 compounds are connected with over 24,000 miles of underground pressurized cable vaults as well as radio and microwave systems. All sites are accessible by both vehicle, by a county road, and military choppers. The missile field sprawls across nine different counties and it also spans much of the highest rated wind resources in the world. Hence our issue. Some of the other issues, unlike a lot of states, Montana had no z military zoning statutes. Issues with Malmstrom were viewed as local problems rather than of a statewide concern. Eight of the nine missile counties have no permitting system for buildings other than the required state permits. State permits in Montana are for, water, are for plumbing and electrical only, 
and they're issued after the fact, they are an inspection process before you turn on, there's nothing in the front about those. <clears throat> Zoning in Montana really is a four-letter word. There are 56 counties in Montana, exactly one has countywide zoning and that's my county. And I'm still amazed we got it in, quite frankly. Uh, no formal organization existed for the nine counties that, that cover the missile field, but there was a statewide organization of all counties. The community of Great Falls has worked very diligently to have a tremendous relationship with Malmstrom, but the other counties have not really been involved in that effort. I think our clicker's done. So how do you establish communication in that? Well, what we did is we looked to see what relationships already existed between the civilians and the military leadership and between the counties and how we could work to expand those. In our case, the key elements were our military affairs committee of our chamber of commerce, which works very hard on the interface between the base and the military. We have uh, a co-commanders program, I know a lot of bases have it, where we, uh, we take a civilian family and we attach them to one of the officers of the military and they basically become their uh, guide into the community, their social events together, they're responsible for making sure that that member of the base gets integrated. We have the Central Montana Defense Alliance, which is a relatively new organization that deals with education the about the military mission to uh, the other people in Montana outside of the missile area, uh, handles our lobbying. Actually, Mr. David Wiseman is with me on this trip um, he is the chairman of the Central Montana Defense Alliance. And then we had the Montana Association of County Officials. So we went to use these existing organizations to form lasting processes and organizations. We instituted a JLUS, which I already mentioned that Matrix was our contractor on. And we used the, we created within MACO, the Association of County Officials, a standing organization called the Missile County Coalition. And that has all the county commissioners from all of the nine counties that have missiles within them are part of that organization. And we use that organization heavily within the land use study uh, as part of that team because since nobody else but Cascade County has zoning, the implementation of our JLUS will be at the discretion of all of those individual county commissioners. And so it was important to integrate them into the system on the front end and using the, the, um, the Mako Missile County Coalition allows us to do that. You've got to make sure that both your civilian and your military planners have to be educated. How do they work together and the importance of it? You've got to require your planners, both from the military side and the civilian side, to be problem solvers, not roadblocks. It's really easy for planners, I don't know if it's something in their mentality or what, but planners seem to be really able to say no. Now we've told our planning department, you never say no. You find a way to make it work legally, make it work appropriately. I never want to have a developer come say that your planners wouldn't work with me. Not acceptable. Same has to be on the military side. And you've got to create an automatic interface between those planners so that the civilian planners become used to working with the base planners and vice versa. Do the base planners need to be involved in every planning decision? No, they'll get bored to tears. But you've got to make sure that there are points of commonality, that the staffs know each other, that they work together, and you've got to identify points early in the civilian processes where it's appropriate for the military to step in and weigh in. Now in our case, we did some real simple things like just making sure that they get a copy of everything that comes through so they're just basically on our normal distribution list for any sort of zoning changes or special use permits that come in. And they can decide themselves if they think they should engage. But we also have zoned out areas where if anything happens in it, uh, they are formally invited to the process to make sure that things work. And you've got to have a formalized method to resolve the conflicts as early as possible. On an ongoing basis, Civilian leadership must be willing to enforce through whatever land use policies they have and tax policies. No encroachment. The reason I put this in <clears throat> is, like I said, eight of the nine counties do not have land use planning at this point. However, we all have a tax abatement tool. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the economic development tools that exists in Montana, your state may be different, but I'll bet you you've got something that's of a similar nature. County commissioners in Montana can 
reduce property taxes by 50% on new and expanding industry and then for, the, for five years. And then after that, it ratchets up by 10% a year until it hits maximum. In the case of a large wind farm, you're talking about a chunk of money for O&M purposes, okay? Because you're reducing that tax burden during the first five years when the, the non-depreciated value of the windmills is at their peak. A county that is willing to make use of that, for example, very simply, in our case, if, if, you don't, if you're doing a wind project or an, a renewable energy project, if you don't get Malmstrom sign-off in Cascade County, you don't get permits. In the other counties where we, they, they don't have the permitting process, they could still say, if you want the tax abatement, I want the letter from the base commander that says your project is not a problem. If you don't have the letter, no tax abatement. That's a big carrot to industry to make sure that they go through the process at Malmstrom, even though regulatory, we can't make them do it. But you've got a financial incentive, which actually works much better than regulation in private sector. You know, I used to be one of those private sector type guys. I much preferred the carrot to the stick, and I think everybody in that business still does. So there are other ways of doing things besides just regulations. This one is important too. Military leaders must recognize that reasonable constraints are appropriate and the value that and renewable energy has a value to all of us. This one I bring up because one of the first things we encountered at the base when we started expanding and talking about the, the missile field itself, oh, I should step back a little bit. For those of you who are not familiar with the missile field, all of the sites have electronic monitoring systems. Through, scattered throughout the, the missile field, each 10 missiles is controlled by what's called a missile alert facility. Those are secured compounds where there are security guards all the time, and, if they, and they constantly rove the missile sites by car, or actually by pickup, but they rove the missile sites checking security. If an alarm goes off at those sites, they're dispatched to them to check the site, make sure that there's nothing wrong. I mean, obviously, you're talking about the, the safety and security of a nuclear asset. So they don't take a lot of chances. If they get a security alarm that goes off showing somebody is inside the fence compound, they dispatch a helicopter. Now, this looks like 15 Rambos, complete with the bandoliers of, of, uh, of weaponry, jumping into these helicopters. And they take off, and man, they boogie. There's, there's no goofing around. So we know intuitively that the emergency helicopter flights at Malmstrom are from the base to a specific silo. They're not, you don't fly from A1 to A2 and then jump over to Oscar 6. I mean, it's just not how it works. But yet the first time we went to the base, to the military, or to the helicopter commander, <clears throat> and we said, hey, look, at, we're looking at this JLUS, and we want to make sure we don't screw up your flight corridors to the sites. So we'd like to, you know, can you define some corridors for us? His response, we have to fly everywhere, anytime we want. So there is no corridor. And I said, so you're claiming the airspace over 23,500 square miles over everybody's private property. And his response was basically yes. So the military has to be reasonable too. We obviously got that fixed, had a little discussion with the base commander. Uh, but, you know, it's got to work both sides. Both sides have to, be, have to recognize that this is important to establish and to build the relationships to move it forward. And for that reason, the relationship between the civilian and military leaders must con continually be cultivated so that we understand each, either, each other's processes and those processes remain in place. Now, in the Air Force, we're lucky if we keep a base commander two years. So, I mean, this really is an ongoing, you know, we like to, we like to tease them about, about, about the time we get them broke in, they leave. You know, so we fix them and then somebody else takes them. But, um, so this is going to be an ongoing process. <clears throat> I'm going to give you two examples in closing that I, I think will kind of highlight this. And these are actual examples. In Cascade County, once again, we have zoning. So whenever anything is built, there has to be a location conformance permit. It's not an onerous process, but it simply is you come to the, to the uh, planning uh, department, tell them what you want to build, and they tell you, yeah, you can build it in that zoning district or not. And the zoning districts are, you know, the classic example is to keep the guy from building a pig farm next to your new house. You know, that's what zoning districts are about. 
So this wind developer, and these guys tend to be, you know, and for good reason, when they're out in the field and they're trying to purchase easements and, and options on land for wind, they don't exactly run some up the flagpole. I mean, they, they locate places they want to put anemometer towers in, they'll do that uh, very quietly, and then when they find out what resources they want to buy, they go meet with the, the landowners privately, and, and people may or may not know what's going on. So this developer had very quietly purchased options on a bunch of land for wind towers in the middle of the missile field. He'd gone through the FAA approval for the sites, but that didn't trigger that Malmstrom knew about it or that we knew about it. First thing we know about it is he shows up to get his location conformance permits. Now my planning guys go, um, the rules in Cascade County are, if you're going to build a wind farm, you talk to the base first. He goes, well, I got my FAA approval. And they said, no, you go talk to the base. Guy got a little belligerent. He said, well, I'm going to go talk to the commissioners. <coughs> Poor guy. I was the one that happened to be in the office that day. Um, so he came in, and I first question is, have you talked to the Malmstrom? He goes, I don't have to. I said, wrong. Until you come in here with a piece of paper that says Malmstrom approves, you don't get permits. I can't be any simpler than that. So he, you know, kind of pouted and went out to, to visit with the folks at Malmstrom. They went through the review, and there was one tower that was a problem. Out of, out of the whole development, one tower would have absolutely blocked a microwave uh, interconnection signal to a missile site. Malmstrom pointed it out. We sat down with the maps, my planners, Malmstrom planners, and developer. They found a different site for that one tower. Developer got his permits within the normal time, within the normal 60-day time frame that we operate our permitting process. So it didn't cost him any extra time, didn't cost him any extra money. Malmstrom's happy, he's happy, okay? That's what we're trying to get to with this. So the developer can do what he needs to do, or she needs to do, without the military suffering. And because our processes in Cascade County require that the base is part of it, that isn't a problem. Neighboring county, another not so happy case. In the 50s and 60s, when, Monster, or when the U.S. Air Force bought the easements from local farmers for the silos and the MAFs and the cable vaults, uh, <clears throat> they didn't get all, the, all those recorded on deeds. Monstrum has a full set of the files, but they never recorded a bunch of them. So the property has changed hands. People have bought property with title insurance, no easements on the property. <clears throat> so they start to do something. Monstrum shows up and goes, hey, wait a minute. We got, a, we got an easement. You can't build there. New generation of farmers now works the land around the silos, and not all of them understand or are aware that the, the easements exist. This one particular farmer uh, signed an agreement with a cell tower provider. He put the cell tower within the 1,200-foot easement, circular easement that surrounds a, mi a missile silo. <coughs> Since that county doesn't have zoning, there were no permits required, only the state permit for the electrical inspection after the fact. Literally. One of those helicopters full of the, the guys with all the, all the toys scrambles to, re to respond to, a, to an alert, pops up over a hill, and here's a cell tower they didn't know was there. Now, happily, the pilot was able to avoid it without a problem, but what you end result is you got a completed cell tower within the safety zone. It's got to be removed. Landowner's in trouble with the cell company because he sold them the rights to put up something he didn't have the rights to sell. Cell company is mad. The safety of the airborne security team has been compromised. And the only people happy, the attorneys. So with that, that kind of gives you an overview of where we are. Uh, once again, Cascade County is the proud host of, the, of Wing One, the original aces in the hole. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to respond. Yes, sir. Uh, can you discuss, uh, I'm here to find that out. <laughs> Let's do that after the break. <laughs> like I said, literally, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that the clearinghouse was being stood up. Uh, we saw a problem locally and began to figure out how to trap it and, and deal with it. And like I said, we still have the issue out in the other counties that don't have zoning. We're still developing how we're going to trap the information that there's a development occurring in order to make sure it goes through the correct process. Now, the clearinghouse obviously will be a big help with that. 
if they can get the wind energy people to always come through them, then that gives us a trap point as well. But my, my personal feeling is at least for some time, there are going to be ones that slip through the cracks. And so both local government and the clearinghouse are going to have to be coordinating this to make sure that between the two of us, we see all these projects. And obviously now, we will change our procedures so not only Molstrom sees those requests, but we'll pump them up to, to Dave and his guys so that it goes through the whole process. But I think at least for a while, there's going to have to be multiple level traps in the system. Yes, ma'am. Mostly it'll be done at the county level to start with. Uh, like I said in, in my presentation, the state thus far has viewed this as a local issue. Now one thing that has changed in this last legislative session based upon these issues, we were able to get past for the first time what we called our Military Affected Area Leg Act that gives all counties, regardless of whether they have, have assumed zoning powers or not, limited land use right around military facilities. Um, that was a starting point. Uh, that, that session in Montana, and, well, first of all, Montana legislature meets for 90 days every two years. Now, a lot of us would prefer they met for two days every 90 years, but we're, <laughs> we're, stuck, we're stuck with the two-year thing. <clears throat> so you've got you've to act quickly. And we, we, uh, we went in with a piece of legislation. Um, this session got all wound up in the eminent domain issue. It was very much a property rights issue, so it was tough to get anything passed. It wasn't exactly what we wanted, but we got something passed that we can work with moving forward. Um, as the JLUS comes out, the JLUS is basically going to have a menu of recommendations. Each jurisdiction will choose from that which things they're going to implement. But we're pushing hard to make sure that we, we implement elements of it that at least require the notification of Molnstrom in all of these processes. And we've got a, we're, we're building rapidly the kind of relationship we need with all the counties that I think they will do that. Uh, they're not going to be willing to move forward with the full zoning because that would get them all kicked out of office and burned in effigy at least. Um, but, but that's kind of where we are now. Uh, other questions? There are a whole bunch. Yes, sir. Two points, just comments. Two points made that are critical. Every state is different. Uh, I've been up to Grand Fork, <coughs> Mm -hmm. In your county, the same as in Grand Forks, the county commissioner could say, no, go talk to them. We can't necessarily do that in the entire country, depending on the right. law. The second point you made that's critical, and I, I think this throws something to Dave that we've really got to do well. People don't even know he, he exists. They, they, there's probably 70% of our bases out there, wing commanders, base commanders, group commanders, have no idea there's a clearinghouse out there that can give them assistance, or at least steer them in a Right. Absolutely. You, sir. Well, even with the, the clearinghouse, there's still a common issue with some of the forces that are down on the military side. And there's also the thing is the installation on that is usually a trailer from one of your tenants in there. And they, and they start to set requirements and all that. And that's where we find out that there is an alternative. And the state will never be able to do a blanket approach to everything the state is saying. It's still going to have to be a local county yep. community approach to that. And I think that's one of the places where maybe Great Falls has an advantage because of our Military Affairs Committee and the co-commanders program where those officers are paired with, with people from downtown, quote unquote. Um, we have an extremely good relationship with the, the officers of all the different wings. And so literally if a question comes up, I'm in the position that I know who to call. And I know that a lot of, lot of uh, elected officials in other counties don't have that advantage. And that's all been provided to the county through the Chamber of Commerce MAC committee. So, and that's why I put the slide up that talked about what existing organizations you've got. 
because you don't want to have to recreate the wheel. Uh, you want to utilize what you've already got in your community and what's working, and that goes back to the issue of why every community's solution is going to be a little different. The only thing that, the only key elements, I think, are the communications, and that, that communication is early and often uh, as you go through this process. There were other hands up, too. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, what we did is we identified key elements that were civilians within the planning department at Malmstrom, and there are key elements. Um, for example, a f gentleman by the name of Phil Rainsforth uh, is actually on our technical advisory committee for the JLUS for exactly that reason. We don't have to worry about Phil leaving because he's a civilian. Yes, sir. Well, I think we're getting started, but obviously, you know, we all have a lot to learn in this business. Who else? Well, let me take one more, and we'll, then we would have a break. Yes, ma'am. That's going to be really difficult, and I think I think we'll turn that one over. Are you? Fair enough. Dave? I'm Dave. Nice great to meet you, Joe. Quite a few phone calls. Um, I had uh, I spent a great deal of the last 12 hours either in Reagan National Airport or in between Reagan National Airport and my home in Northern Virginia with a number of bounce back, so I apologize for that. I thank Steve Bonner um, for warming up the karaoke machine and singing my song. Um, in terms of how the clearinghouse works, and uh, to uh, just to dovetail to something that Inspector Rousseau tossed out there, the reason we haven't been able to go out and jump up and down and say we exist and write guidance about the fact that we exist is because technically we have only existed for 10 days. Spent the first six months in the job uh, trying to put things together and build the coalition that we thought how we wanted it to be. Then on January the 7th, the president signed the NDAA, and we immediately shifted from thinking what we wanted into how do we execute what Congress has told us to execute. And it was 10 days ago on July the 15th that uh, new Secretary Leon Panetta actually signed the order that said, okay, all of the stuff that's in Section 358 of Public Law 111-383, um, the Under Secretary of Defense, or the Deputy Secretary of Defense, is the senior officer responsible for all determinations. The Under Secretary for AT&L Acquisition Technology and Logistics is the senior officer for managing the whole program, and the lead organization is the Office of the Deputy Under Secretary for Installations and the Environment. And I am a direct report to the Deputy Under Secretary. So now that the um, a congress said do this and the secretary has signed a piece of paper that said this is the chain i hereby delegate these authorities down this particular chain now we're going to execute now in terms of 15 days um, the only thing that holds us to a timeline is the faa process that is directly enumerated in the law and the fact that Congress says you have 30 days to respond to official FAA applications. 
the early voluntary consultation process is not defined by a specific timeline. Um, that's also, you covered the rule in, uh, that will also be in the rule that we publish and we are within days or so of sending it over to OMB now that we actually exist according to the secretary. Um, but that will have to be a negotiation between your, uh, the local base folks and how your um, county or uh, city council wants to do things. I used to put on the fancy blue duds and go stand up um, before uh, six different city councils, four county commissions, and I would grip and grin with um, two senators and three congress members. And uh, the gentleman who was talking about tenant units, at Nellis I had five wings and 52 different tenant units. There was probably not a week that went by in my two year tenure that somebody didn't show up to my office and say, hey, I've got this little eight person team and we occupy this closet over here. I'd say, really, I'm responsible for supporting you too? So it gets to be tricky. Long way of saying, um, the reason these two gentlemen are here is because they had the vision to reach out uh, Terry Murphy and Kevin Smith of Solar Reserve had the vision to reach out to us and try to create something. Um, had they not come to my office first, we would have never known about it. And we created the couple of folks who were saying, how do you uh, get these relationships? We had to create a public partnerships office. And I had to fight uh, the United States Air Force for about a year and a half to get the authority to put a couple of positions for someone whose job really is, as our 42-year uh, community planner back here has mentioned, someone whose job it is is to maintain those relationships. And because of those four county commissions that we dealt with, Nye, Clark, Lincoln, and Esmeralda, we had to create a situation where a couple of staff sergeants and tech sergeants just scoured the um, agendas of four different planning commissions and four different county commissions and tried to guess if some of these applications might have something that they wanted to be a part of. Um, and we did that because the 99th Air Base Wing is responsible for 42% of all the land that the United States Air Force manages. You know, I was in essence the uh, county manager of an area larger than Maryland. So, um, May I have your that doesn't sound good. Must be time for a break. 10.05 to come back. Nice to meet you. Fantastic words. I could have written your script myself in terms of here's how to do it right. So, uh, thank you. Know.